And uh, I just want uh, Dior to show you the, uh, at least this t-shirt. Dior, if you don't mind, real quick, honey, I don't mean to embarrass you, but come up here. I want them to write. All right, just so you understand the camp theme, because camp confirmed a couple things for me, as did Sister Barbara Morang, our missionary from Honduras, who was here the week before last. Okay, but that was the camp theme, you guys, Soul Wars. Okay, so you see it's kind of like Star Wars, Soul Wars. <laughs> Thank you, Dewart. Thank you, honey. Okay, um, but when Sister Barbara Morang was here, and, and, and spoke word of God to us. One thing that she said that I couldn't help but write down, uh, she made the comment that prayer is a gift of connection. Prayer is a gift of connection. Reading from Mark chapter 9, uh, verse 14. And let me say that uh, this little story I'm going to read to you brings up a lot of questions. I, I'm, I want to focus in on one particular phrase that involves prayer, okay? So you're going to have to just try to stay focused on, on what I'm trying to focus on, okay? All right, but here it goes. It says, when they came to the other disciples, they would be Jesus, Peter, James, and John, because they had just come from the mountain of what's called transfiguration, where they saw something very miraculous and powerful happen uh, between the Father and the Son, okay? Uh, but they is Jesus, Peter, James, and John. They were the only ones up there. They, when they came to the other disciples, there was something going on with the other disciples at the time that Peter, James, and John were experiencing something very powerful, okay? Uh, they saw a large crowd around them, around the other disciples, and teachers of the law arguing with them. So some of the religious authorities were in a debate of some kind with the other disciples that did not go up to the mountain uh, uh, to see the transfiguration. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. Jesus asked, what are you arguing with them about? A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, so in addition to his lack of being able to speak, whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. Folks, most of us would call that a seizure. And I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. This man brought his son looking for Jesus, but Jesus was up in the mountain of transfiguration. So there's the other disciples, and uh, the man figured, well, this is as close as I get to Jesus. <laughs> okay, the problem is that uh, nothing happened. You know, this, this condition. Jesus replies, you unbelieving generation how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the Spirit saw Jesus, see, you and I probably wouldn't be equating this to a spiritual matter. Did the young people leave me? So they, they went, they, they had class then? Hmm. I thought they would be here. <laughs> That's all right, Justin, let them be. Parents, relay this to them then. Okay? Uh, because at camp, during the soul war, at the very end, uh, there was uh, uh, some concern from one of the other churches about two young men and their spiritual condition 
which ultimately they identified as some form of, of spirit, whatever you want to call it. Um, not possession, I hope, because I, I wasn't there at the point, but of, uh, definitely of oppression or, or a, uh, a, a strong influence. All right. You understand here there is a young boy whose conditions are being described, the symptoms as he can't speak, and he has these seizure-like symptoms. Not everyone who cannot speak or has seizure-like symptoms necessarily has the same problem as this boy. But they identified it correctly as a strong spiritual influence. Uh, they bring the boy now to Jesus because Jesus said, bring the boy to me. So they brought him when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. And he fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. So now it's happening right in front of Jesus. The disciples weren't able to, they, they tried. Though they had cast out demons earlier because Jesus had sent them out. Two by two, and they came back surprised at, at the authority of the name of Jesus. And, and the miracles that had happened. But in this case, the disciples couldn't, okay. Um. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. And, and it, it is worse. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. So it, this spirit had directed this boy to even further uh, hurting of himself, it would appear like to us. But it's actually spirit driven. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. This is the father pleading for the son. And uh, Jesus says, I I if you can, said Jesus, uh, everything is possible for one who believes. At this, the father, uh, the, immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. And then he says, help me overcome my unbelief. A amen, which is an interesting, you know, dichotomy it's you know it, either, it almost how you almost want to say well do you believe or don't you okay except that every one of us relates to that expl explanation uh, right I've never heard anyone who say to me oh that you know that can't be no somehow we understand you guys we believe sometimes we need help with our unbelief that's not the phrasing I'm, I'm uh, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, his preference was to handle this a little more privately. He rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And the spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, which would be the little boy again, and came out. And the boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, at this point the crowd is there and all they're seeing is this boy maybe laying on the ground, the spirit having come out as Jesus commanded the spirit to come out. He's dead. That's what they're, you know, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors... So now the crowd and this, even this boy are no longer there. His disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And verse 29, this is where I want to uh, land. Uh, Jesus replied, this kind. In other words, something about that spirit. Some distinction indicating that maybe not all spirits are the same, possibly not all spirits are of the same strength even, okay? Uh, not really my main point. That this kind can come out only by prayer, and some translations will have and fasting. All right? That's the 
phrase I want to talk to you about for just a couple minutes, and that is, what is this that Jesus said to his disciples in private to help them for the next time? That he, he, his response, you know, why couldn't we do, why couldn't we do this when he says this can come only by prayer and fasting? Uh, you guys, let me say, prayer and fasting uh, was very much a part of the Jewish faith. The Pharisees practiced it a lot. Prayer and fasting. It, it was a, a, for them, it was a religious work. Jesus is not indicating that uh, the fault is because they don't spend enough time in prayer or necessarily don't fast enough. In other words, Jesus isn't telling them that the fault lies in a lack of more effort, more religious effort on their part. What he is trying to say, and it is what Sister Barbara Morang said, that prayer is a gift of connection. Let, let me tell you what was missing that was needed to deal with that kind of spirit. And it was a greater presence of Jesus than at other times. That's what really Jesus is indicating when he told to them what you guys need is to, if you will, you need to bring more of me into the scene and a little less of you. Folks, and that is a big deal. And that is a big understanding, especially for those of us who know about religious practices. We need to, uh, uh, one translation actually put it, uh, this kind does not come out only except by focus and refocusing. You know, what was it that was missing when those disciples, it was that Jesus was a little bit more distant. And when he comes down, what is his instructions except to say, bring the boy to me. Folks, not more religious work on my part, but, great, but greater connection and focus on Jesus Christ was what was needed in that scenario. And you know what is needed in most of our scenarios? That greater connection. A amen. I spent a week long with a bunch of young people. You know what I pray more than anything else? Not that they every, you know, they can't be in that atmosphere forever. But from that atmosphere, can they take a, a greater recognition that what they really need is the very presence of God more and more in their daily life? Amen. Not greater effort on my part, but a greater dependency on Jesus. We need to bring into our situations... And sometimes they are more spiritual than we realize. We need to bring more Jesus to bear on the situation than, than uh, uh, more of me. Our tendency is to increase our effort. <laughs> That's not what he meant by this kind doesn't come up but by prayer and fasting. What he was saying is what you guys need is a greater connection to me. Bring the boy to me. You guys, I heard a sermon uh, many years ago, early 20s probably, about, um, from John chapter 15. And uh, this was confirmed to me. I didn't realize it, but for those who were here Wednesday night, I do believe uh, uh, Brother Moise used this as his text on Wednesday night. John 15. You guys, the, the, the message that I heard, it was in a teaching session. It was not a, a church service. But I, I remember the guy called it the vital connection. Uh, that's my sermon title here, the vital connection. Vital means life and death. If something is vital, it is absolutely necessary. 
If something is vital, it means the difference between it's going to work or it's not going to work. It's going to live or it's not going to live. If the doctor looks at you and tells you this is vitally important to you, that's beyond telling you that it's important. So I, I want to uh, uh, talk to you about this, you know, by prayer and fasting, it being a way of saying the vital connection. This kind of demon is going to do a thing unless you, you have me closer than what you had me. Jesus says in John 15, the first couple of verses, Jesus says to his disciples, plain and clear, I am the true vine. Which implies there may be other vines, but somehow he is the true vine. You might be able to plug into some other things that work some of the time. But if, if you want the, the ultimate in God, you better plug into the true vine. Amen. Meditation might help calm some nerves. But meditation, uh, unless it's meditating on Jesus, isn't going to get you into heaven in the afterlife. Okay. It has some good effects, maybe. Uh, exercise can have some good effects. <laughs> but it will not have much to do in the afterlife. Amen. You might be able to take some medications and help you out. But true spiritual need will be met only in Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Folks, this is God's will for our lives. Not just that we believe in him, but that we produce what he desires to produce in us. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. As I also remain in you, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. And neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Folks, that's the vital connection. You know, he's describing a probably like grapevine. And most of us know that off of the vine comes these little branches that are just connectors. And eventually, if that little branch stays connected long enough, uh, 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 if it's not clogged up or removed in any way, it will absolutely, over time, produce what the vine is pushing through it, which is grapes. Grapes. In verse 8, it tells us this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Folks, Jesus Christ calls us to be believers in him to start us off. It's in our remaining in him and producing fruit that he desires, that he brings glory to him, whereby we become disciples. And that's all an issue of the vital connection. And as uh, uh, Barbara uh, said to us, you know, uh, prayer is a gift of connection. You guys, our habits of a disciple that we talk about in our commitment series, that's part of the vital connection. It doesn't matter if you just started walking with the Lord last week or if you've been walking with him for 70 years now. I can tell you, you need communion with God, which prayer, uh, praise, worship, um, uh, that, that discipline, that, that action of communicating with God helps you to stay connected. It helps you to remain in him. It allows God to flow through you to produce what ultimately he wants. 
Amen. If you don't have a prayer life, you're cutting off the flow. The habit of God's word. Amen. If you're not taking God's word in on a daily basis, not a weekly basis, not twice a week. It's a daily basis. It doesn't have to be my, the reading schedule I love passing out. That helps me a lot. Okay? But amen. Then you, but read something of God's word. Every day. To help the flow happen. Obedience. Every day. I thank God that you're faithful here on a Sunday, on the Lord's Day, and in the coming together of God's people. That's part of a command of God. But there's a lot more. And most of them have to do with us outside of here. Amen. When people offend us. When people are not nice to us. How, how is that? We respond. What kind of, you know, do they control the flow or does God control the flow? Does Satan control the flow or does God control the flow? Folks, we pray and we read God's word that we might truly draw closer to him, that he might flow through us more. The habit of fellowship. It's not just an option. Amen. Uh, there's people, Christian people, who conk out because they don't understand that you were created to be in fellowship with other believers. So no, no matter where, it may, maybe the location in the congregational life might change as God directs, but uh, ultimately all of us ought to be connected to the body of Christ somehow. It's vital to the connection. You guys, and, and those are the four that we list. Uh, uh, I, I distinguish one more now, and that is the habit of service. That in my mind, it's impossible for you to keep growing to the point of producing what God ultimately wants until you realize that where he's taking you is into servanthood. You are his disciple, and he was the greatest of servants. And he called you to be the same. He even told you, you want to be the greatest in my kingdom? Then become the servant of all. Even as I came, not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Folks, service, uh, if you're not involved actively in an ongoing, regular, and it may not be here even. I, I can accept that. Though I can tell you now, we would like help up on the sound board. <laughs> all right? I, I would like help with youth camp. Uh, I would like help with our teaching department. I'd I would like some help with the hospitality department. Amen. It's what keeps it going is that more people grow to the point of recognizing, hey, what's my part? How do I help? I, I can tell you now, if, if church is all about, you know, God doing something for you, you're an infant. And nothing wrong with being an infant because all of us start off that way. But after five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, you're still an infant, that's a problem. As far as God's concerned, you are cutting off the flow of God in your life. Folks, our greatest hope rides with our greater faith in God, not our effort. We got to be careful with that. Because that's part of Satan's message. And, and it's a losing battle because you'll never be that good. You'll never be able to give that much. What you need to do is bring more of Jesus to bear on the situation. What you need is to double check the connection between you and him. So that Jesus can be more present to help that boy. Let me close with John chapter 6. Folks, if what, if what, those, if that, if what that little boy needed had been people, you know, with a strong regimen of prayer and and fasting, 
those scribes that were arguing with the disciples would have met that bill. They, 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 they did do that religiously. There was just no true connection to God. Jesus told his disciples that their righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. And I'll tell you now, you'll probably never exceed their religious practice. But you might exceed their, the true connection that they had or that they didn't have. Folks, and therein lies the key. And that's why I you know, love that sermon, the vital connection. In John chapter 6, uh, verse 20 and 7. Do not work for food that spoils. Folks, how many of us work for... Because we want to eat. Because we want shelter. Because we want, you know, the, the daily needs. Folks, that's not telling you that not to work for that. It is stressing to you, don't work only for that. Okay? There's other scriptures that call us to diligence in those things. But never for the sake of self-sufficiency. Never for the sake that somehow you develop yourself to where you are enough, especially in the soul wars realm. You best have Jesus with you at that time. But, but uh, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. Which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval, which is Jesus, right? So the next verse says, uh, then they asked him, and, and this is our, why, you know, you guys, we're so quick to want to, but what, you know, my part. Okay, the, then they asked him, well, what must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus makes as plain as day answered the work of God is this and what is it to believe in the one he has sent you guys you will never go wrong with emphasizing Jesus Christ you'll never go wrong with waking up every day and 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 focusing more on the vital connection than on any other work that we do. Now, because of the vital connection, we will do works. But folks, we need to be careful. You know, our faith is not in works. Our faith is not in faith. That's a bigger problem. You need to think about that one. But <laughs> there's a thing called faith in faith. And that's not the key. Folks, the vital connection is faith in Jesus Christ. That's the one work that we must be adamant, focused, refocused, committed, recommitted, devoted, uh, redevoted. That he might be present. That where I go and I speak, it's because I'm so plugged into him that it's his working and his speaking. Folks, not bringing more of me to bear on the situation is bringing more of Jesus to bear. Bring the boy to me. Amen. Parents, God bless you. If, you, if your kids from camp have any questions, um, uh, you know, I wasn't there. Uh, uh, you know, they, they cast demons out of those boys. On the last night after they had dismissed the camp, but there were still, for those kids that wanted to stay, you know, they're permitted to stay and worship longer. That's heavy-duty stuff. But the truth is, soul wars will take you there. There is a reality. I'm thankful. I'm not looking. There's, the two far extremes is uh, uh, Christians, uh, uh, they see a demon in everything. They're almost paranoid about demons. That's a problem. But you know the, the other equally bad problem would be that you never see a demon. That you never see a demon. A matter of fact, I'll, I'll name two, and you don't think of them this way, but they are. Somebody told me one time that the greatest 
demon of the United States is materialism. And I'm going to add one because that was 20, 30 years ago. That the new demon that dominates our society is simply the demon of entertainment. The demon of entertainment. God, and Satan, doesn't, Satan doesn't have to get you to do any bad thing. All he wants to do is get your focus off Jesus. Don't let Jesus be central in, in, to, to your life or your children's lives or, or, or your neighbor's life or whomever. That's all Satan is interested in. And he's got a very powerful tool now. And it's just called, I'm going to keep you so entertained, you don't have time. That's what you tell you. I don't got time to pray. I don't have time to read God's word. I don't have time to be obedient. I don't have time to fellowship. I don't have time to serve. Folks, that's a, I'm not kidding you. That's a biggie. And while I'm not, uh, you know, I, 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 um, I, I try to be sensitive to people who are not as spiritual and don't understand all of this. But I won't, I do not hesitate, you guys, to, in my praying, direct Satan to get out of certain situations. As, as I pray that God would move, I will say, you know, and you, you'll hear me periodically. I'm not trying to scare people. But if you're going to believe this, then you have to believe the whole thing. And there is an enemy of our soul. And there, it is a soul war. I am valuable in God's kingdom. Satan would like to have me, too. And same thing with you. So, folks, I hope that every so often you are aware enough, not every single time, but sometimes, to understand that there may be some spiritual war going on. And as you pray for your loved one, you, you might want to pray, Satan, uh, be bound. Imps, be bound. In the name of Jesus Christ now, but make sure you're close. Check out your vital connection. Because it's not just a formula. It's not just a ritual. It's them demons somehow, uh, as they did in the book of Acts. They said, Paul we know, and Jesus we know, but who are you? And with that, they, those demons jumped on those seven sons of Sceva guy, guys, right, Moise? Folks, they didn't really have that vital connection to Jesus. They just had heard about him through Paul. And they met up against some demons that, that, that did not respond <laughs> to simply the name. They would have responded, though, to more Jesus in the situation. Hallelujah. Let us stand. Praise God. Folks, uh, um, God bless uh, uh, the Lloyds again. They, they just gave me the address to the luncheon which is actually 123 Lloyd Road. That's not the... Oh, I'm sorry. That's true. That's where I'm meeting you guys. Oh, oh that's true. Right. There will be a reception following their, the, the service and the interment. It will happen at the Chatham 